great pleasure to be here. Uh, sometimes when I'm speaking in uh, America uh, at uh, libertarian conferences, which I do sort of quite a lot of, if I'm not banned, um, <laughs> So uh, it's very interesting to meet, especially great numbers of young people uh, in South America. I was in Brazil a few uh, months ago speaking to over 5,000 young people at a libertarian conference and of course at the Mises Institute. So I now regard myself as it were as a spokesperson for my brand of libertarianism, which is uh, slightly difficult for me because I'm probably the only libertarian who's a member of the Lord's Day Observance Society. Uh, which is admittedly uh, not necessarily compatible. Uh, but the idea, perhaps this morning, uh, is to give some ideas uh, or, or some views. And of course, I know there's a, there's a little bit at the end for Q&A, but uh, answers I have none, of course. When I was in the army uh, and you did a course, a promotion course or something, uh, very often they would say there's no DS solution, no directing staff solution. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, the case on libertarianism and traditionalism. Uh, there is no specific answer. It isn't a mathematical problem. Uh, it's, it's what really is in our own heads and our own hearts and how we view it. So I thought I'd approach it perhaps from a fairly empirical view. I'm not an academic, uh, although I do lecture quite a lot in academic circles. I don't pretend to be an academic. Uh, I just, as, as our chairman said, I tend to say it how I see it. Uh, which makes me some enemies, but paradoxically makes me quite a lot of friends as well. Uh, having been elected twice, I can't make that many enemies, although I wouldn't have elected <coughs> twice, presumably. Uh, so, with a group like this, I would, uh, I think I would start by looking at the law, and I deliberately haven't touched on religion because I know Mr. Gilliam is going to cover that in some depth, much far more effectively than I could. And uh, so uh, I don't intend to go uh, down that particular path, uh, but I wanted to look at law to start with, amongst other things, uh, because one of the things I think perhaps we could argue is that law uh, is a tradition. Law, certainly in the United Kingdom, is a tradition. And I would argue that if you can trace common law back as far as Alfred the Great, and indeed we can, I don't think it's unreasonable to argue that a lot of our law is based on tradition, common law, that which has gone before. And of course, if you look uh, at Magna Carta, which people are suddenly starting to remember exists, so we went a long time without hearing anything about it, and our Prime, Min Prime Minister, when he was on American television, seems to have never have heard of it. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing what uh, an Eton and Oxford education can do for you these days. <laughs> I'm just a grammar school boy, so uh, but even I could just about get a handle on Magna Carta. Uh, but of course we know, don't we, that Magna Carta was only a reinforcement, as it were, uh, a reinforcement uh, of that which had gone before, which was uh, the concept of common law, and indeed one might argue natural ju justice, uh, as applied by a form of judiciary. Uh, and of course, though I hesitate to mention it, of course Magna Carta was of course annulled by the Pope uh, <laughs> shortly afterwards because uh, King John had uh, done clever deals behind the scenes, but I think we're going back a thousand years or so, we can forget that. Well, that's all right. Um, so the whole point of law, I would argue here today, um, the law is to protect the freedom of the individual, it's to protect the citizen, that is the point of law. Law is to protect uh, the individual from the despot or the monarch, uh, and, and I think it's a shield. It was never uh, appropriate or right uh, that the executive, as we have now, should select, as it were, or appoint the judiciary, uh, which means that, excuse my vulgarity, they all piss in the same pot. That is not uh, what the law should be. Uh, and if we, uh, and, and, and of course that was in, reinforced, of course, in the time of Tom, Thomas Jefferson, of course, made that very point. He made that very point. Uh, that, that it is a it is a dichotomy if you have this problem of of, of the of the lawmakers uh, uh, being uh, uh, totally uh, connected uh, to those people interpreting the law, and I'll come up onto that a little bit later when it comes to regulation. 
So where would we perhaps look from an historical perspective? I think a group like this might suggest perhaps you might go back to Edmund Burke, uh, who, although perhaps not a philosopher, libertarian philosopher uh, in, in that particular sense, but was, if you will, a conservative or traditionalist spokesman. And, and we know that Edmund Burke took a very different view, did he not, from the French Revolution to the revolution in the American colonies. And he saw that the French Revolution had actually got rid of all tradition bag and baggage and replaced it with a terrorist, if you will, mob rule which he was first to condemn, he was quick to condemn quite rightly at Burke, in the teeth of some opposition at the time, of course, uh, and he proved to be right, uh, and, uh, and, and history has made that judgment. And the reason, uh, of course, that he was sympathetic uh, to the American colonies uh, was for the reason that is very often glossed over now, certainly by uh, our American customs, uh, certainly when I was at the Royal College of Defence Studies, serving there with uh, a lot of American officers was quite interesting, uh, their slightly revisionist view of history. Um, uh, of course, what they were actually after, uh, the American colonists, uh, they were after the protection of the law that, of course, we in England uh, and Great Britain uh, had at the time, which was not extended to the colonies. And I speak, of course, of the Bill of Rights, the 1688 Bill of Rights, which was a protection which was not enjoyed by the colonists, uh, which kept uh, certain things that we sort of w would take for granted, which are uh, no representation, uh, no taxation without representation, and no cruel and unusual punishment, all the things, of course, you, that you find in the 68, 1688 Bill of Rights. Uh, and that's what they were actually after. At the initial stages of the American colonial uh, rebellion, it wasn't to set up an independent state from the empire. That was not the original view. That was not the original idea. They just wanted the same protection that was offered uh, under, uh, from the glorious revolution uh, that, uh, that was enjoyed by us here. Uh, and we were very stupid. George III administration uh, were very stupid not to grant that. If they had granted that, we might have seen a very different uh, map drawn today because I would suggest the United States would have stayed within the empire and achieved dominion status and eventual full independence. And it would have gone the way of Canada, I would argue, probably 100 years later or 120 years later. And I would argue, I would argue, the world would be a better place for it. Yeah. Um, uh, because all that's really happened is now they've, uh, and I speak as a libertarian, I have to be careful, especially in America when I talk about the British Empire. Uh, all that's been based is the British Empire has been dismantled and we ran it very well. Uh, it was very effective and it had its bad bits, but generally speaking, I think it was a force for good as, uh, as history yeah. will show. Um, and I think the new American imperialism is simply not a force for good. I think it's a force for evil, yeah. and most, most of my friends, uh, libertarian friends uh, in the United States, completely concur. So it's like us here, uh, when we go abroad, people perhaps criticise the United Kingdom for the antics of our government, which have nothing to do with us, sadly, under the system that we now have. Uh, the sort of Muppets that run this country now have no support <laughs> at all from ordinary people, which is why, of course, ordinary people, generally speaking, have disengaged from politics. And that's a, that's a great show. But if you go back to the theme that I would argue about law and its protection of the citizen, and I can only use from, a, you know, from an empirical point of view, I'm an Englishman, brought up in England, uh, and, 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 and so that's what I have experienced, and I think it's always difficult if you're looking at other people's traditions. But certainly I think perhaps I could almost even speak for the Anglosphere. Uh, that, is, uh, that is how it has evolved uh, over many hundreds of years and many generations, 
Uh, and of course, as we all know, in Washington, there is a fair copy of Magna Carta, uh, which they revere. They, 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 they believe that that was the start, too, of their written constitution, or, or, or written in one constitution. We have a constitution, too, which is generally forgotten, of course. It's just not in one document that you can put on a tea towel. Uh, uh, but it's, it's there, nevertheless, and extremely important uh, for that. Uh, but that protection uh, gave, over a number of years, over the generations, I think the English legal system, which I regard, warts and all, to be one of the best that the world has ever seen, which is why it has been adopted by so many other countries mm -hmm. on the face of the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very good system, and it gives us some fundamental principles um, of English law, which I regard, when I was doing my exams as a young boy, uh, in the city, struggling through my general principles of English law, which was written heavily on my soul, uh, that, uh, that there were certain principles uh, which were Im immovable, as it were, and that was the presumption of innocence, which is extremely important, uh, trial by jury, which of course came later and only in part, and I accept that was a very slow process, as indeed was habeas corpus, a writ of habeas corpus. This thing did not happen overnight, it didn't happen uh, all at once. It evolved over hundreds of years. But it does mean that we had a system, we had a system up to relatively recently, uh, which gave you some fundamental principles. That's trial by jury, the presumption of innocence, and habeas corpus. And some of those fundamental principles, which I think are the rock on which a good legal system should be founded. And again, when I was studying at the Royal College of Defence Studies, I used to have to sit and listen to lecturers from Lancaster House, largely paid by the Foreign Office. Yeah. And if you have any doubt about it, the reason it's called the Foreign Office, just like uh, Yes Minister, is it's because it represents the views and interests of foreigners. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, they'd call it the British Office, wouldn't they? Yeah. Of course So I had to listen to these sinister, I'm sorry, I can think of no other word, sinister people telling me, or telling this group of officers from all over the Commonwealth and North America, uh, one star, of course, one star, two, two star, of course, that it was a very good thing that we got rid of uh, the concept uh, of the principles of English law, and it's now being superseded by the, the Napoleonic Code, if you will, or Corpus Juris, uh, which is, of course, the European Union system, and 75% of our laws now come from Brussels, and they come, uh, they come as directives, uh, there's no debate, there's no cost-benefit analysis, they come straight in uh, with the rubber stamp of the Parliament I used to belong to, Mr Gillibrand is quite right, you could put a room full of gibbons in there and they would do a better job. And, of course, they come from a background uh, where they simply do not conceive or do not understand uh, the principles of English law and the importance thereof. And of course, uh, that it manifests itself uh, in the European arrest warrant, uh, which of course is a fundamental principle of this new European uh, system that we have, this new Napoleonic Code, where you can be arrested for something in this country by a foreign policeman without prima facie evidence, without a magistrate's warrant, taken away without the protection of habeas corpus, trial by jury, or the presumption of innocence. And it's happened. And it's happening more and more. And when I asked this comedian from Lancaster House about that, he didn't like that, I don't think, uh, I, was exp you know, I was trying to explain to the group who was sitting down there uh, uh, from all over the world. I said, well, this isn't true. He, he was telling us this. I said, well, that isn't true. You can now, that under the European arrest warrant. And he waved his hand. He said, oh, yes, I know, but not many. That doesn't happen very often. Like, you can have a principle of English law which can be waved through because it doesn't happen very often. Well, you know, murder in Belgrave Square doesn't happen very often, does it? So, well, that's all right. There was one just, it just happened. It's always meant to happen very often. <laughs> the sort of, sort of people that we are dealing with, again, I go back to the Prime Minister, people who look like they've had the benefit uh, of an education, but not as people in this room would understand it. Um, they've ticked the boxes. Uh, you know, they've got their 2-1, they've got their job in the city, or they've got their job in politics, or whatever it happens to be. Um, but it's not an education as we would understand it. Not certainly not, I suspect, in this room. Uh, and that means that you give things away uh, which people, these protections of, for the citizen or the subject, 
and they don't know they have when we're talking about the uh, uh, teaching religion, teaching uh, the Church, Church, Church of England, or certainly the Christian religion in churches, uh, in, uh, in schools, uh, which personally I would concur with, but that's by the by. Uh, but I believe that, that to be right. But I would also uh, like to see, I would regard as important, as important, possibly even more important, the fundamental principles of English law which are gradually being taken away from the citizen because they do not know that they have them. And it's very easy to take something away from people if they don't know they have it. And I always use the analogy if I'm speaking at universities, if you come into my drawing room where we have knickknacks from all over the world, most of which aren't really worth very much money, particularly the plastic gondola from Venice. Um, <laughs> but that could be alongside a silver snuff box given to me by Great Auntie Betty. So it's all sort of scattered in all over the drawing room, you see. Well, my wife and I don't have a clue what's actually there. Uh, so if you wanted to palm any of that over a gin and tonic and take it away, it would be years before we knew that it had gone. And we'd probably never find out. And if we did notice, we'd go, well, I don't. When did you last see it? I don't know, 1958, I think we saw it. <laughs> and then you move on. And I'm quite sure your houses are all the same. Knickknacks all over the place, some valuable, some not. And you don't know what they are or where they are. But that's, it's far more important that our youngsters know about the principles of English law. They know about these things. Uh, so they can't have them taken away. Uh, and I speak a lot at six forms, I speak a lot at universities, and most people have absolutely no idea what the principles of law are, or indeed how they're governed. I don't know how many times you've sat round a dinner party table, have you, and you get your woolly-minded liberal or your woolly-minded Tory who pontificates about how we are go governed and how the government should do this and how they should do that. And if you then leap in and say, would you just like to explain so I'd like to explain for the benefit of everybody just how that works, because I don't think everybody here, Freddie, actually knows how it works. Change the subject straight away, because he hasn't a clue. But it doesn't stop him pontificating about it, uh, but he doesn't know either. And I am talking about sometimes men of my own age who read law at Oxford. They have no idea how we are governed at all. Uh, and if they don't know, how on earth is the man on the clap of on bus going to know? that wonderful man on the clap of all yeah. uh, And it brings us back again, if I may, to the protection of law, the legal system. Uh, and uh, from, uh, go back as far, if you will, uh, Sir Edward Coke, you can go back as far as that to see an Englishman's home as his, his castle. And now every Tom, Dick and Harry from the council can walk in with some sort of chit, some little man uh, from the town hall. Uh, he can say that an Englishman's home is no longer his castle, which I think is another fundamental principle of the English way of life. Uh, and this is why... <laughs> this is why tradition and libertarianism are not at all incompatible, because your house should be your ca castle. It should be very difficult for anybody to come in there, but certainly up with at least a magistrate's warrant uh, with a, on, a, on a serious charge. Certainly not... Uh, any Tom, Dick and Harry that can now do it. And you can come forward for Sir Edward Cope uh, and you can come right up, can't you, to that, uh, that uh, legal judgment in the 1930s where, when it was deemed to be, English law was deemed to be, that which is judged fair by the man on the Clapham omnibus. And I think that's extremely important when it comes to natural justice because I know we don't have omnibuses anymore, but we are all that man or we are uh, antecedents of that man. Uh, and it's got to be deemed to be fair. And now, of course, we have hovering over us uh, a total and utter breach of tradition where our final uh, court of appeal uh, is no longer the House of Lords, uh, but is the European Court of Human Rights, a completely broken tradition. And that tradition uh, was to protect us. It protects us, the, the, House, of, uh, the House of Lords. Uh, and I think I need to refer I need not refer to any of you here to The Winslow Boy by Terence Rattigan. You know, you'll have seen, the older ones around will have seen the film with Charles Lawton in it, and I gather it ran in the West End quite recently. Uh, and that is, again, that's a play that I would make every schoolboy and girl uh, watch to understand what a wonderful system that we had, that you could take something right to the House of Lords on a matter of principle uh, and win. That's a wonderful and extremely moving play. Uh, and it tells you all you need to know, in my view, about the wonderful system of law uh, that we have abrogated our responsibility for. 
uh, and by, uh, by politicians, uh, most of whom I would hang. Uh, so, we also have something which is equally sinister, uh, and that is, uh, that is the Enabling Act. We have the Enabling Act, the concept of an Enabling Act, which actually takes the entire system of law away uh, and gives it to a designated quango, where the people are beholden to nobody. And their only system, there is no court of appeal. Uh, there is only judicial review. And you will find it quite extraordinary how many people I speak to uh, or in positions of authority in various fields and professions who are, do not understand the difference between judicial review and a court of appeal. And if you want uh, the, the, the best story or the best illustration of this, of course, was a few years ago, I'm sure you'll remember, where there was a West Country dairy farmer uh, who had not kept his paperwork right uh, and the quango in question then was DEFRA uh, and it went to judicial review and the High Court judge at the end of the judicial review said this herd is perfectly healthy, that is not a point of issue uh, and DEFRA are not suggesting that the herd is anything other than healthy but it has to be slaughtered nonetheless because that's what the rule book says. How far have we strayed away from what the man on the cl clap of omnibus would deem to be fair? Prescriptive legislation. It cannot work. How is it even conceivably possible that somebody can sit down of all places in the Commission or the European Parliament, the House of Nonsense, how can they sit down? <laughs> and come up with something that we've had generation after generation for hundreds of years, uh, some of the greatest legal minds uh, and the wisdom of juries when they weren't selected from park benches. Uh, when, we had, when we had people who had made those judgments that, that had gone before. And all that's been flushed away. Uh, and so uh, we no longer have the protection of the law. Uh, and when 75% of our laws come from Brussels, and you will also know that we have more laws made uh, since the uh, advent of the Blair government in 97, uh, since that time to the present day, more laws in, in that period have come in because of this new system than we had from the Bill of Rights in 1688 right up to 1997. An extraordinary, an extraordinary situation. Hundreds of laws, 200 laws, uh, 200, 2,000 laws go through every year in the European Parliament. And for those of you who have been there, and I know a number of you through, we used to have to shout, we oldies in the UKIP, we used to have to shout, slow down. We, we couldn't get the Zimmer frames out of the way to stab the button. The laws were going through so quickly. Nobody understood them. Uh, everybody was just looking blankly, voting yes, no, because we were voting no, because we're sort of the Groucho Marx party. <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, we're against it. So we would just vote no to it all. Um, so it would have made it easy. Uh, but <laughs> no, 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 shit, that should have been a yes. <laughs> it's our annual yes. Uh, so for some reason. And uh, so, you know, we have this complete mismatch of, uh, of, of regulation uh, and enabling acts. It was interesting from the Financial Service Act, I was the first apparently, according to the Daily Telegraph, the first man to be ejected from the Mansion House since John Wilkes, uh, which I think was about 250 years ago, uh, for actually heckling Lord Turner, and I believe in tradition, I do not like breaking tradition, I am a traditionalist, uh, but it was uh, interesting that in the debacle of 2008, the greatest failure uh, of, of banking and retail banking, the City of London regulated uh, by Lord Turner's FSA, uh, and he kept on criticising, quite rightly, retail bankers' obscene bonuses, but kept on forgetting to mention he just handed out a 15% bonus that year to everybody at the FSA for presiding over the biggest cock-up uh, hmm. in the history of the city. And all I did was just pop up and say, just like you, Lord Turner, just like you, Lord. Every time he said bonus, I said, just like you, Lord Turner. Anyway, I hit the street. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they were not taking that day the broad, flexible outlook. It's, it's interesting these people like Lord Turner, the great and the good, in charge of their quangos. They are consistently wrong about everything, aren't they? And they go from one call for a million pound a year job to the next. <laughs> Off they go, being wrong about everything, and then they've got another one. They took a lot of nonsense two years later, and the FSA has failed, there's something else now. Uh, it, 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 
call something else. Same people, same pension schemes, same offices, all the same people. They've just called it something else. They've just changed the name outside. And they think we won't notice. That's the thing that irritates me about uh, the great and the good and politicians. They think, they all think that we're stupid. We're not as stupid as they think. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I find that sort of thing very annoying. And what do we have with the FSA uh, and its successor? A complete coach and horses through, um, through the principles of English law. So what the Financial Service Authority has then, and they can now, its uh, successor can do, is they write their own rule book, which is four million words long, four million words in the FSA handbook, which they write, which is subjective, which they interpret in a subjective manner. They then uh, adjudicate themselves behind closed doors, and there's only judicial review, there's no court of appeal, and then they fine whomsoever they feel has transgressed from their four million words, and they keep the fine. They keep the fine. It's now got to the stage where Neil Woodford, one of the great fund managers in the city, doesn't invest in banks at all, because uh, the whole system is rogue. The whole of the FSA, the whole regulatory system is, 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 has gone rogue. And I was the first politician, actually, while I'm on the hanging subject, I was the first politician in the parliament to call for hanging a few bankers, because it concentrates their minds wonderfully, I think. <laughs> uh, I suggest, but of course, what actually happens is, and the concept of, I try not to digress too much, it's a hobby little subject of mine, um, fractional reserve banking, uh, which is, you know, when they lend you money that they don't have, if you go back to... Uh, if you go back to America in the mid-19th century, that was illegal and you would hang for it. And now, of course, they've got a whole multitude of rules and regulations, uh, which, of course, are a shield. They're a shield for rogue bankers because they say, you can't hang me. I ticked every single box in the regulatory examination just last year. And so they can all walk away, where if you took them, if you took some of these scoundrels to an old-fashioned court of law and, uh, and, and a proper court of appeal and a proper jury, uh, these characters indeed would at least be incarcerated, and that I include the central bankers who are just as bad. I block them all. Uh, so it isn't just about retail bankers, it's about central banks and their yeah. political masters. Yeah. The whole damn kitten to boodle. And it comes on to money, traditionalism, libertarianism, Money, one of the most liberating things, as von Mises, uh, 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 his thesis uh, demonstrates quite clearly, is for libertarianism, to the protector of the individual is real money, tradition, real money. What is real money over the last 5,000 years? Well, it's gold and silver. That's what real money is, not pieces of paper. And there'll be a few of you possibly who can remember when that great white five pound note used to say, I promise to pay the bearer on yes. demand the sum in gold at the Bank of England. So that piece of paper actually meant something. And of course, from the collapse of Bretton Woods, uh, they, they got rid of the gold standards. And all, of course, and, and all that did was just print money. And now well, everybody prints money. It's meaningless. Um, and it's not libertarian. Uh, because they've broken with the tradition of what real money is, which is for 5,000 years been gold and silver. Well, who suffers? Yeah. Who suffers when that happens? When it's zero interest rates and they print money? Any of you who've worked and saved all your lives for retirement are watching their savings be washed away. Yeah. And no interest on your savings. Annuities are worthless. Uh, and this affects the ordinary diligence. If you're in debt, of course, under the modern welfareism, uh, you know, you just walk up and say, well, no, I'm sorry, I've boozed it all the way, and I don't care, I'm 65, gimme, 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 and the state gives you. If you walk up to them and say, well, no, I've been quite prudent, actually, they say, I'm sorry, mate. Uh, and when I was uh, in the Territorial Army, it was quite interesting, I had guys who were quite uh, miners, uh, who were, uh, I commanded a squadron, a mining squadron, throughout the miners' strike, incidentally, they were all miners in South Yorkshire, which was an interesting experience. <laughs> um, but they were, uh, when they got eventually their gratuities or they got their, their pension or their lump sum gratuity, uh, they would spend it on world cruises, on you know, going on p &A cruises. And because they would say to me, what you've got to understand, sir, is what you've got to understand is, if I keep this money, <clears throat> we don't get anything. 
we don't get them. We go, we have to pay the rates, we have to pay this, we have to pay that. We don't housing benefits, whatever benefits they might get. So we've got to blow it. And so they blew it. And the most, <clears throat> the most fiscally responsible thing that these people could do was to blow the money. What kind of society are we running? What kind of society are we running here? And that's because we get away from the tradition of rewarding thrift, which is a tradition. And the tradition that we used to have of friendly societies in the 19th century. Friendly societies and mutual societies have all been blown away now and the state's taken over. And with their regulation, as again, von Mises says, you cannot regulate unless you have perfect knowledge of the market. You must have perfect knowledge of the market, which is absurd. How can you have perfect knowledge of the market to regulate? So you then have people, and I've sat through uh, economic uh, committees uh, in the European Union, uh, where you get Danish housewives pontificating about regulating hedge funds. Yeah. I mean, bless them, they've got cotton socks, they haven't a clue. And I was 40 years in investment in, in the city, I've got bloody clue either. So she certainly didn't know. <laughs> so you get all these nonsenses and of course winding up on, on the military, uh, a tradition that we had of course in the military, and the military, ex-military uh, of you, and there will be some. Uh, no, we used to have the court martial, the court martial system, uh, which was being got rid of because of our membership of the European Union. Now that was a very good tradition because it protected the individual. The court martial protected the soldier. Because he'd go into his CO, and, it, and it, we, we knew that he'd been a scallywag, he'd be naughty, he'd nick something in town, whatever it happened to be. Will you take my judgment, or will you go for a court martial? Soldier would always take your judgment because you knew him. Two days' pay, mind the barracks, whatever it was, march him out, sergeant major. And that's what we used to do. <clears throat> if you felt strongly, or it was a more serious charge, you'd go for the court martial. So he would be judged by his own, his peers. Ringing any bells here? Court marshals were actually judgment by the man's peers. And that was right, and that was traditionally protected the soldier. Nowadays, the soldier can now have been imprisoned because of a split second decision he made in Northern Ireland and he pulled the trigger. He thought his life was in danger. And he's locked up like that poor sort of my constituency in the para regiment. He made a split decision like that at 18 years old. You tried being on the streets in those days. Some of you might have been, I can tell you. Split second decisions sometimes you had to make under those circumstances. Uh, and you can find yourself in prison under court martial. You couldn't do that. My first uh, experience of this was when it I was commanding a squadron uh, in Doncaster. Uh, and this little man came from the council. He was elf and safety. He was elf and safety. Anyway, he came in with a little mill board. Uh, and he looked around everything. He came into the officer's mess. Uh, and he found, as it was a Monday morning or something, and he found all the fish and chip papers in the officers' mess, because Friday night, fish and chips, old group, look at it, get out for the weekend. You see, that's been doing it since they invented fish and chips. Uh, anyway, can't do that, because Elf and Safety said that was, that was a danger. You know, that was dangerous, and we had to stop doing that. Uh, so anyway, I had him frog marched off the premises. <laughs> <laughs> and I told the Sergeant Major, I said, if I see him again, you have my full permission to give him some rifle butt. We never saw him again. <laughs> what a surprise. And I think if more of us, if more of us stood up like that and said, no, 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 on your bike, if more of us did that, they can't arrest all of us, for God's sake. And of course, now we've got this latest thing, isn't it? And, and, and it's amazing. When are we going to get, uh, when are we going to get the sort of media, when are we going to get the sort of television presenters that should be protecting us? Because they're a part of protecting uh, in a libertarian society, in a free society, they should be protecting us. When somebody says you can't smoke in a London park, what they're actually saying is an old age pensioner can't smoke his pipe in St James's pa pa uh, uh, Park on a park bench. Is that what we're saying? Is that where the country's got to? Is that where we've got to now? And nobody said, nobody said, is this the role of government? Not one single interviewer said, is this the role of government? It was, you know, can you catch a lung cancer from somebody sitting the other side of the park smoking a pipe? They were the questions that were asked. They were the questions that they're all the wrong questions. These are the wrong questions by the wrong people, but they all are the same. They're of the same kidney. Your TV presenter, your political journalist, and your politician. They are all the same. And they're not libertarian, uh, they're not traditionalists, they're not anything. They're not anything. But I do leave you with the thought, I don't believe for one second 
uh, that they're not compatible because I believe libertarianism and traditionalism, traditionalism is the protector and the father of libertarianism and it doesn't matter how far you go back, uh, I think it works and it works for us all and I think we're all on the same side.